welcome the Fine and Country Real Estate Academy, especially designed as one-stop shop in providing practical real estate training in all relevant areas. In a few moments, we'll have the CEO of Fine and Country, Mrs. Udo Okonju, come to take us through intelligent real estate marketing, defining your niche in the local market, and she'll be using Fine and Country West Africa as a case study. Mrs. Udo, you have the floor now. Thank you so much, Champion Lamy. Thank you um, for some moderation. Welcome back, everyone. Good to see you back here. Hope everyone had um, some some time to reflect on what we've been learning. And thank you for also sharing some of your top uh, takeouts in the chat box. Want to make sure that we have this on recording. Fantastic. Awesome. So, um, Tim and Tony send their regards. They've been sending messages. Um, you know, obviously, they recognize that they came into the session on um, a day where we're all obviously reflecting on the incident in Lagos, which there's no way you're in the sector, connected to the sector, that you don't feel a sense of heaviness of some sort. Um, and in a sense, from my perspective, it's it, it, it's a wake up call, and it's you know it gives us a lot of room for deep reflection, as professionals in the sector, as stakeholders in the sector, whatever hat that you wear, um, it's it's all about standards, all about standards. It's all about you know determining where you want to play, how you want to play, and who you want to play with in an industry that has all commas at every level of the game. For us at Planning Country, we've been very clear um, about what sort of a game we want to play, who we would like to play it with, and how we would like to play it. By no means are we perfect, and we are not seeking perfection. All we're seeking and pursuing is excellence. And by no means have we always attained excellence. It is a pursuit that we constantly are on. And for us, it's important that we keep it front and center of everything that we do. Over the last 12 years that we've been in the market um, in uh, West Africa, we have leveraged and layered on the foundations of our global network, the values of a global network of Fine and Country International, and adapted um, you know, the fine work that has been done by and with Fine and Country International to our own market. The nature of the Fine and Country Global Network is such that you have to be a leader in your market. You have to demonstrate the capacity to lead by shaping uh, the market or the industry that you operate in. Um, in addition, as an individual and as a professional uh, coming from the uh, legal field where standards are very critical. Um, as a matter of fact, you have to go through multiple layers and multiple um, exams and standards, you know, to join the legal profession. It's not enough that you study law. You also have to do what we call be qualified to join the bar. So when I joined the Nigerian bar, um, I had to be qualified to join the Nigerian bar. When I joined the New York bar in 1993, I had to be qualified to join the New York bar, the Nigerian bar in 1991, the New York bar in 1993. And what professionals um, or professional organizations do is that they set standards. And those standards then become the base from which everyone must operate. Um, and anything else that you do in addition to the standards become the extra. But the whole idea of professional uh, sectors is that they set standards. So I say that to say that obviously we're in a market, we're also in an economy, we're also in a region where standards are generally reflective of, um, you know, the culture of the, of the market, of the environment in which we operate. Um, so if we say that we have a system that there's a, a lot of corruption, it's also a system where standards are being compromised. And at the end of the day, we are part of that system and it's our responsibility to continue to, as it were, um, encourage ourselves, expand our minds and expose ourselves to the right standards so that we can all hold each other accountable to do better. 
With that said, I would like to go into um, the next session um, and, and the next segment of this three-day uh, real estate marketing and sales masterclass. This whole masterclass is in line with um, the idea that we can all be leaders in our sector. We can all raise our games, raise our standards, and we can all learn from our shared experiences. The intelligent real estate marketing is a system that Fine and Country has put together and we use to serve our clients in the upper quartal of the real estate market, both in the residential and in the commercial space. Um, what I'll be doing in this particular segment is that I will be sharing with you seven power principles that have defined the way in which we operate in the form of a case study, a fine and country case study, so that whether you're in-house or you are an independent uh, real estate professional, you can find some principles that you can apply. I like to say that there are no extraordinary people or extraordinary firms um, or countries even, but there are principles, extraordinary principles, which if applied, can make you become extraordinary. So it's not people or companies or countries that are extraordinary, it is the principles. And the good thing about principles is that you, principles are universal. Principles don't discriminate. If you commit to the principles, if you, and that's why when I was talking with uh, Tim and Tony in the previous uh, session, I kept pulling out the principles. Because if you can identify the principles, if you can define them, if you can nail them down, and you begin to apply them, you will get the same results, irrespective of the context, because principles are universally applicable. And so with that being said, what we've done is to put together what we refer to as our system. And when we talk about intelligent real estate, what we're saying is that real estate is not a random occurrence. The activities in the market, whether you're a developer, whether you're a marketing firm, whether you're an in-house uh, sales team, it's not random. It has to be designed deliberately. It has to be given intelligent thought. It has to be based on strategy. It's based on three core things that we look at. So we look at, first of all, the vision. We look at vision, we look at strategy, and we look at stakeholders. These are the foundational principles, right? So whether you're a company, whether you're a marketing team, whether you're a developer, the question is, what is your vision? That's the starting point of everything. What is your vision? If I'm, if we have a sales team and we're going into a project, the first question we ask is, what are you looking to accomplish? It's interesting, and perhaps some of you may have encountered, you know, uh, uh, stakeholders, developers, sellers, who their vision is all over the place, or they have none, or it's not clear. So I'm building something. Who am I building it for? Why am I building it? Who is my ideal client? What problem am I particularly solving? Okay, I'm in the axis of the Lekki Ekpe axis and all the properties there look alike. Four bedroom terraces, three bedroom terraces, mini clusters, mini developments, or plot and land, or land uh, uh, plots of land, you know, um, that have been reclaimed, fenced, and then you put sites and services. What is it that makes you different? Why are you doing this? What is the problem that you're setting out to solve, as it were? Remember that what we're doing is we're doing a case study of developing, create, identifying, and creating your own niche. And it starts at the vision level. So as a company, as an individual, as a firm, as a team, who do you want to serve? Why are you uniquely qualified to serve that particular audience? or target market? What are the driving principles for you in that particular space? And we're gonna share with you what our own vision was, but it's really just to lay down this three foundational principles. So if you want to indicate to me in the chat section, do you represent a developer or are you um, um, a real estate uh, professional in the sense that you're, you're an agent, you're an estate surveyor, uh, value. I just indicate that in the chat section, just so I get a sense as to, you know, who is in the room and um, the sorts of examples that we'll be getting, because I'll be pulling your own examples. So let's see. I see an estate agent. Fantastic. Keep it coming. Just put them in the chat 
uh, box, what um, aspect, okay, developers here, estate developer, fantastic. Right, so if you are an estate um, uh, agent, right, and you're a developer, just indicate what segment you serve, okay? Because you can serve the entry level, um, you know, property uh, segment, which is you're dealing with first time home buyers, it could be that you're serving students. I had a young investor many years ago who was just focused on building for people in law school, right? Small units. Some people want to serve people in the luxury segment. Some people want to serve, um, you know, I'm also going to be pulling in international examples. Some people want to serve maybe, um, you know, the nursing market because maybe they build mainly around hospitals, right? Um, you know, some people want to serve um, uh, some people want to serve uh, embassies, right? Diplomatic uh, service, you know, so they tend to build towards the particular specifications. So for example, around the Koyu Victoria Island, right? If you serve the diplomatic um, market, right? The embassies and that sort of um, uh, market, you will need to then understand what are their needs. What matters to them? What is important to them? It's important that you know that. If you're serving people in the diaspora, someone had asked a question earlier, how do you target them? The question is, what is their pain point? What is their problem? What makes you and your product uniquely the best product or service for them? So there are lots of questions that need to be asked at the vision level. It is when you then determine what your vision is, who you want to serve, how you want to serve them, why you want to serve them, then we start talking about strategy. So in our case, we came into the market, we wanted to serve in the upper quartile. That's what Finding Country International does worldwide in the 260 something odd locations and offices where we operate. And then coming into the Nigerian market in 2008, the question was, where do you want to serve? Where do you want to um, operate? And we very quickly identified that we wanted to operate in the new build space, right? New development, off-plan development. The reason for that is that uh, um, is on two levels. One, that's where you find more what you would refer to as more difficult challenges. So the example I gave earlier on about how the steward that I put in the property went, it, went on to rent it and essentially became your competitor. When you are looking to sell or, um, a new development of 50 units, 100 units, or 30, or a new estate with hundreds of units in it, your steward can't do that, okay? So for us, in terms of you know, a space that, is a, that has a problem that is not an all-commerce game was important. But more importantly, because we felt we had intelligent solutions which were more suited um, for developments and for projects that had more intricate needs. Um, you know, it's at that level that you then begin to look at, you know, the profile of the investor. You're looking and seeing that different investors have different things that they're trying to accomplish in terms of their investment. Why are they there? Why are they doing residential in that particular location? Why are they doing commercial? Why are they doing mixed developments? You start looking at their funding strategy. It's a totally different game. Okay, and we felt that we were uniquely qualified to do that. The third reason was that we recognized that the real growth was going to be in the area of new developments, because as I like to say, we are a developing economy. And so if we're a developing economy it means that we're going to be developing properties, right? And so we felt that, you know, in terms of economies of scale, that it would be more impactful and better leverage for us to work with projects that have multiple units because the solution that you provide uh, for those units will be higher impact. So those were some of our thinking. And so if you say you want to serve the upper quartile, which is like your luxury space, premium uh, real estate market space, then your strategy will now need to be adopted to that. The way you sell, uh, the way you market, the way you do your business development, the way you connect with your clients and the customers is different, okay? From if you were selling something else. That said, the principles are universal. You can apply similar principles and adapt those principles. And so for us, we decided 
based on vision that we wanted to operate in the upper quartile and then two we wanted to serve uh, you know the luxury premium residential space that's where we started and three we wanted to also serve new builds and so our strategy came from there from the fact that this is who we want to serve therefore how do we serve them how do we reach them and how do we reach the off takers everything stems from there as you will see as we go along in terms of stakeholders you know when we talk about you know foundational principles it's always important to identify who really are your stakeholders um certainly in every country in every economy stakeholders are multi-dimensional um, the reason that we're having a collapsed building, for example, and there's even any talk, you know, about, oh, who should be held responsible is because we're still developing. It's because we still don't yet have established, you know, systems and institutions. Anywhere else in the world, if something like this were to happen, it's very clear where the responsibility sits, where the responsibility lies. It's got nothing to do with the buyers. It's got nothing to do with the off-takers. It's got nothing to do with even those who are offering these properties. It has everything to do with the planning, with the development authority that gives those permissions and that monitors those developments, right? But as a player or as a stakeholder in the industry, it's important to identify who are really your stakeholders. So in the real estate sector, if you say you're serving in the residential space, you have, if you're a real estate agent, you will have developers. On the demand side, you have the buyers. On the supply side, you have the sellers, or you have the developers who may be your clients because they give you these properties. If you are an in-house marketing team, it's important to know who your stakeholders are, right? Your stakeholder is your company that gives you the property that you're selling. Your stakeholders are the buyers that you're reaching out to. Your stakeholders will be other agents also right, who you can collaborate with and who you can partner with. Your stakeholders are the regulators who you must understand because remember that at the heart of intelligent real estate is that we're also building trust within the target market that we're serving. And one of the best ways to build trust is to have knowledge. Now, how can you have knowledge if you do not know who you are serving and how to serve them? So, it's important to take stock of who your stakeholders are. For us at Fine and Country, we look at the regulatory authorities as stakeholders. So whether it's tax, whether it's the zoning, it's the developmental authorities that give the permit, um, you know, the banks can be part of your stakeholders because if a bank is funding a project, they will put a project manager to make sure that that project is going on. And so it's important that you understand that and you understand their stake and what they contribute. Because we deal with high-end real estate and developments that are mostly funded and financed by part equity and part debt, we then find that we're also interacting with the financiers as well as the developers. It's important to understand these relationships because how you manage them will be determined uh, or rather will be a major success factor for you. Working with other realtors, other professionals, um, whether it's lawyers, architects, or whoever can refer um buyers to your projects they're also stakeholders and for us we take that uh, seriously it's important to know who you're, you're you're dealing with also when you're dealing with the buyers who are the stakeholders within the buyer's ecosystem you may be selling to a wife but really it's the husband who's paying you may be selling to a husband but really it's a wife who's making the decision who you never see you may be selling to a husband and wife but maybe it's the children who actually are going to make the decision a few months ago, we were showing a penthouse to a, a client. And, you know, first of all, they came alone. Then later, I was with a wife. And then after we thought all the decisions were pretty much, you know, the question was, is there anybody else who needs to see this property? Guess what? Lo and behold, the adult children. And guess what? Those adult children are sophisticated. They're exposed. They're intelligent. And they are a key part of the stakeholders' constituency. But if you do not know this, you may think that you have, you know, nailed the deal, but meanwhile, you have left out certain stakeholders. I'm gonna stop at this point because I, you know, this segment, you know, we're, we're going into, you know, principles, teachings, and I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, so far, as far as the principles that have been shared, do we have any reflections? Are you on the same page? Have you gotten the top points that I've shared? And if you have, 
I would like to see um, your top takeout so far, and we will jump right into um, the additional principles.